The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.org. Well, good morning. I am so excited to introduce to you our speaker today, who is going to be talking about analyzing um, analyzing our genealogy information and um, through using timelines. And uh, I had the opportunity to hear Carrie's, several of Carrie's programs through um, Legacy Tree webinars. And she is an excellent speaker and extremely qualified to talk to us today about this topic. Now, the great news is Carrie Tap Taplin, our speaker, um, is related to Roy Rogers. Or at least that is what her family had told her. So as a result of that um, enticing information that she had heard uh, growing up, she decided to find her true heritage and has been focused on that since the year 2000. She's a native of Wood County, Ohio, but now lives in the great state of Colorado. And she did go by way of Texas to get there. Um, as she did live in Texas, in Austin for uh, a few years. Carrie holds the uh, certified genealogist credential and has served in a wide variety of volunteer positions and in leadership for the state, local, and national societies. She is the owner of a great website and company called Genealogy Pants. So you can find her at genealogypants.com. She provides speaking services and shares her expertise as an administrator on the highly popular Facebook group called the Genealogy Squad, which, by the way, I am a member and it is um, a very good Facebook group. And uh, you can post questions on her uh, Facebook group, which uh, she helps co-lead with several other very um, popular genealogists the Genealogy Squad on Facebook. Carrie currently works for Ancestry Pro Genealogist. Um, her personal research focuses on the Midwestern and Great Lakes states. And when she is not working on her genealogy, she's a wife and mother to two young adults. Will you please help me welcome our speaker today, Carrie Taplin. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can't hear it, but I can see you clapping. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Yeah, so let me get my slides going here and then we'll get, we get going. I'm excited. All right. And I'm going to click the right buttons, you guys. <laughs> there we go. And oh, come on. There we go. All right. You should see my slides. Everything good? Looks great. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks for that lovely introduction. I mean, I just am, I've had so much fun in this uh, job, if you want to call it a job, in this career, in this uh, hobby, you know, whatever the situation is in your life, I have had so much fun. And it's true. My family told me we were related to Roy Rogers. And through a lot of research, I debunked that myth. <laughs> so my family's mad at me. Um, and they're not too happy about that. But anyway, that's how it goes, right? Uh, the um, I saw a question go through the chat that somebody was interested in my business name. I'll just give you a little quick story about that. My, when I decided to go full-time as a genealogist and start my own business, um, I was trying to think of a good business name and I was brainstorming with my husband. I didn't want it to have the word ancestry or trees or branches or any of those things that are kind of, I don't know, overdone out there, if you will. And, uh, and so we were just, I don't know, brainstorming and, I don't remember who said it first, but one of us said genealogy pants, and it's because our kids were small at the time. Uh, my bio used to say I have two young children, but they have uh, grown up and <laughs> and have flown the coop. Um, so genealogy pants is like fancy pants. Okay, Mr. Fancy Pants, or all right, Mr. Smarty Pants. Like that was kind of things we said to our kids, and so it just came out genealogy pants. So it's like that. Um, that's it. It's nothing too exciting beyond that. Um, genealogy pants. I've had a lot of fun, fun with it. Anyhow, a lot of uh, good puns you can do with that. 
<laughs> so anyway, we're here to talk about timelines. So let's get to that. Um, I, I use timelines all the time. And if you think about what we're doing with our ancestors, we're rebuilding their lives, right? We're kind of recreating, um, you know, what they did throughout their lifetime. And so it, it just makes total sense to make a timeline, right? So we're going to talk about timelines, variations on timelines, and uh, ways they can help you analyze your research. So we're going to start basic. What is a timeline? <laughs> I think we all know that it's a list of events in chronological order. Um, but, you know, you can do it in a, in a couple of different ways. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about is ways to look at data differently and give you some different uh, information. Basically, you show the lifespan of an individual, but it can also be a timeline of a place or a historical event. Um, so it's not just a, a person necessarily. It's really a great way to visualize. I'm very visual. I love charts. I love tables, maps. You get me with all of those. And so uh, I, if I can see things in order and see things uh, presented outside of just narrative form, I just really understand it better. And so it's just really helpful way to un understand what our ancestors did. And it's just a simply it's just a great research and analysis tool. Uh, so creating a timeline, obviously, you're going to then put those events in chronological order. Um, the events can be organized by a life event or by a document. So if you think about it in terms of you have the person, right, and the, a document might list several different events. Or if you think about it in terms of the document, that document was made at one time, usually. Um, and so, you know, you could put things in document order or in life event order. You can add things like historical events to give context. Um, sometimes, you know, if you look at a greater uh, timeline for the state, the, the town, the state, the nation, it might give some additional context into why they maybe made decisions that they made or things like that. Um, and there are ways to do timelines, lots of different ways. We're going to look at some of them. Um, your genealogy software often can make a timeline of uh, the data you've already entered. Uh, of course, you can make one on a word processor or a spreadsheet. Um, there's timeline creation software and websites out there. Don't underestimate the power of paper and pencil. <laughs> also, I often start by just scratching things out on paper um, to decide if it's something uh, that I need to pursue further, right? And so don't overlook paper and pencil. It, it's fantastic. I have tons of it in my office. All right, so let's talk about timelines in terms of life event. So I only have a couple of documents that give me this information on the screen, but, um, you know, you could pull information from documents and put things in life or event order. So in 1826, I have the birth of Thomas Mitchell. That, of course, is uh, estimated from census records, right? Uh, I have a marriage to Angeline Higdon. Again, I don't have a marriage record. It's estimated from uh, information from census records um, and birth of the first child and, and so on. You know, I have some kind of context. Um, they have a birth, a second birth, and we have land they bought in Cooper County, Missouri. And that's all in timeline in order of the event, not in order of the document. So here's the document uh, uh, order. I have an 1850 census. I have an 1859 BLM land patent. I have a 1860 census, a 62 muster roll, a 64 prisoner of war roll, and so on. So you can see the difference, right? Uh, the timeline is definitely different based on the life of it being described and the actual document's uh, date itself. It just gives you different um, information, right? Uh, you might think, you know, in terms of the document, what else should I be looking for? Or in terms of the life events, what else should I be looking for, right? It kind of helps you see where there may be holes. So for a location, uh, you might want to make a timeline to help you understand county boundary changes and changes in states. And, you know, as our nation grew, our boundaries changed and so, depending on how uh, uh, detailed or close in you want or how large you want, a uh, timeline can be really good to help understand those changes. So this is just a quick one for uh, Audrain County, Missouri, basically. We have in Montgomery, uh, they're right here together. And my ancestor, of course, lived in the corner. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have uh, 1818 Montgomery County was formed from uh, St. Charles. Uh, my ancestor, sorry, here's my pointer. He kind of lived right in the corner up here. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, border dwellers, right? <laughs> anyway, we have uh, Montgomery formed from St. Charles County. Missouri became a state in 21. We have 31 Audrain County was formed, et cetera. So it kind of gives you an idea of when counties were formed, where they came from, you know, where the land, uh, the records might be, and so on. 
You might uh, consider adding some of these things into your timeline if they're relevant. If they might explain why you can't find records in one county, you might need to be looking in another county, for example. You can also add things like Civil War battles. Uh, this area in Missouri and in Cooper County, where they had bought that land prior uh, to this, you know, it was a lot of uh, different skirmishes and battles going on in that area. So those sorts of things might um, be important for your timeline for context. Uh, local natural disasters, other historical events that happen in that location. You might add them to your, your person's timeline to uh, give context. So let's look at some tips, uh, some various things I've tried over the years, you know, and some things I still do and some things I don't anymore, but it just depends really on how you process information, right? How you go about thinking about, um, you know, the data you, that you're inputting. Color coding, for example, this works great for some people and other people, they don't, it doesn't matter, right? And so, to, like I said, just do what works for you. So here are some tips. Uh, color coding, I've done this a couple of times where I'll change the color just of the cells when they moved, right? And so I can easily see at a glance um, a migration pattern uh, or when, where records might have changed. Include footnotes or sources so you know where that information came from. And that doesn't have to be a full on Elizabeth Schoen Mill style citation. It could be as simple as Thomas Mitchell's death certificate. Just so when you're looking at your timeline, you know where you got that, right? You could go back and consult that death certificate and make sure you got it right or something doesn't add up. You can go look at the, the records again. And again, adding items of historical or local importance for context can help. All right, so you might consider uh, these items for your table or your timeline, such as the year of the event. That should be first, in my opinion, because, of course, that's how a timeline is organized, right, by the date. Um, the age at the time of that event. Uh, I like this to give myself some context. How old was he when that first child was born? How old was he when he sold that land? It just kind of gives me some um, additional context. Of course, the name of the event. What are we talking about here? Birth, birth marriage, you know, etc. The location. I have gone back and forth over time in terms of how I write these locations. It depends on how I think I might want to sort the table. Uh, because if you're working in a spreadsheet or a table on a word processor, you can sort the columns by um, alphabet, for example, or by date, by number. And so it just kind of depends on how I feel like I might want to sort that data later. So if I put the state first and then the city, I can sort by state, right? So I can see all the Ohio stuff, all the, all the New Hampshire stuff. Um, but if I maybe don't care about sorting by the location, I just want to keep it in date order, um, you know, that shouldn't matter as much. So there's ways to do it. And, you know, sometimes you have to go back and redo some of these things so that you can um, uh, sort things differently. You know, copy paste is a, a really handy tool. It doesn't make that too difficult. So um, if you do it one way and then change your mind, it's okay. <laughs> and again, adding that source citation information so you know uh, where that came from. So here's one example of a way I've done it in the past. You can see uh, I have the little greater than uh, signs in between. It's just one, it was just something I tried. Um, it worked okay for me, but some super spreadsheet users <laughs> tell me that that greater than sign has a different function in spreadsheets. So if you're doing anything other than just plain text like I am, it could mess something up. I'm just telling you that so that you can take it with a grain of salt. If this doesn't work for you, that's okay. You can put commas, you can put dashes, you can do whatever you like, right? <laughs> but um, this is one way I did it once. And uh, I kind of liked it because I liked having the state abbreviation just right up front. You know, I didn't have my, my eye didn't have to look for the state location. And so this is one way I do like to do it. All right, uh, as far as analysis goes, timelines are awesome for trying to separate individuals with the same names, you know, to determine if you have one man or two, <laughs> right? Uh, we have these terribly common names sometimes we find in our family, like I am, I am cursed to be descended from Williams and Johns and, you know, Fredericks Miller. Right. I have all these names in my family um, with the last name of Miller. And of course, that makes things a little bit challenging. So uh, 
I've in the past run into this um, situation. And so I use timelines to kind of help me decide, am I looking at one man or two? And this is just a really simplified example of what I'm talking about. Um, but you can see, I'll zoom in. Um, you can see we have an 1850 census, Wood County, Ohio, age 27, an 1855 tax roll in Wood County, and in 1862, a deed selling land in Wood County. So those are for William Miller, no middle initial. And then there's this other guy I found who kind of fits the bill to be the same man uh, because William Miller in Wood County seems to disappear, right? And so I'm trying to track him down. So I, I use this double timeline or like a table uh, side by side timeline. So I find this William F. He's in Hardin County, which is just a couple of counties south. I find him in the 1860 census, age 36, so it's about the right age, uh, 1870, 1880, all in Hardin County, right? And so putting this to that together, you know, you could kind of see, well, it's possible, right, <laughs> that this guy is the right guy. He's selling land in 1862 in a Wood County, makes sense that he might be moving to Hardin County, right? It could be the right man. Of course, this is not enough information. You need to do more research, right? Um, so you'll want to use that timeline then to ask yourself some questions. Um, you know, what time gaps are there to fill? What gaps or what records might be used to fill those gaps? And what historical events were happening during those gaps? Anything going on that might have, uh, you know, convinced somebody to move or, um, you know, been, a, you know, those push-pull factors? Anything going on in the county, in the state, et cetera? Other questions, not necessarily in this example, but, um, you know, why, if there's a couple, did they have no children between 1861 and 65? Well, the father could have been off fighting in the Civil War, for example, right? So, you know, looking at this table, what are some of the things I should look at to figure out if I have, if I have one man or two, right? So these are the questions you need to ask. So is there a William F. Miller in the 1850 Hardin County Census? I need to go look. Is there a William in Wood County in 1870, right? Um, you know, there are, are there other records that, uh, you know, could fill in some of those missing gaps or do they disappear from one county, show up in another? You know, you kind of like do this research, answer the questions. Is there another census in 1850 with William F? I need to go look. And if there is, then I've kind of answered my question, right? <laughs> you know, he's not generally going to be in two places at once. So. Uh, you know, those are the, the things this kind of timeline can help you look at. So for more on context, you might include things like the changes in the county boundaries. You might include things like changes in laws at the state or federal level, um, such as like the Homestead Act. You know, and when that Homestead Act came out, a lot of people started moving west. So when did that happen versus when your ancestor may have disappeared, right? Uh, there's various tax laws you might want to understand for your particular state or county dower rights, um, the age to enlist, to marry, to serve on a jury. That's why I like that age at the time of the event, because, you know, it can help me understand, did he enlist too young? If he's too young, maybe that isn't the right man of the same age, or maybe he lied about his age, right? It's, it's sometimes these things make more questions, right? <laughs> but, you know, it can kind of help clear things up as well. Were there any catastrophic events in that area, you know, that may have affected the people or the records? You know, so it's not just the people, but also were there any courthouse fires or flooding or hurricanes? Goodness, thinking about um, Florida right now, hurricanes that, um, you know, wiped out the courthouses and records, tornadoes, et cetera. Um, any major accidents? Uh, like I have a... Um, uh, a major train accident that happened near a town that affected some people. So, you know, anything major like that, wars and the local battles, again, include those historical events in your timeline so that when you're sitting down and assessing what's going on, it might trigger, might trigger some thoughts or might trigger some more research questions to help you flesh it out a little more. So in 1860, I have um, Thomas Mitchell in Cooper County, Missouri. 1861 is the start of the war, the Civil War. 62, he's um, enlisted. I uh, have a Civil War muster roll. In 64, he was a prisoner of war. I found his entry papers in Alton, Illinois. In 65, Lincoln was assassinated. Um, you know, I'm not sure that had too much to do with his uh, specific situation, but it gives me t um, context when I'm looking at how the larger national events may have affected people on a personal level. 
So when you're searching for timelines um, and location, um, you know, or for events or locations, there's some keywords you can use, like when you go on Google. So for example, something like Texas historical timeline, right? Timeline, Missouri, Civil War. So let's just look at a couple of Texas examples. Um, so here's te Texas historical timeline, right? And the one that I liked when I, especially when I did a bunch of Texas research was that uh, Texas Almanac. That was one of my favorites anyway. Um, so here's just a quick look at it, the timeline of Texas history. And I'm showing you this because, well, for one, you guys are in Texas, but if you're searching in another state, many states have something similar. Okay, it may not be called the Ohio Almanac, but it's going to be uh, something similar uh, on various state websites. So here's just a quick look. We could start with the ancient pre-Columbian history. That's a little far back <laughs> for our genealogy. But of course, we can jump ahead to times of the revolution in the Republic of Texas and get some background information. You know, might be, if you're a Texas researcher, might be of importance to what your ancestors were doing, right? Here's Missouri Digital Heritage. I use quite a bit because I have a Thomas Mitchell in Missouri. Um, so timeline of Missouri history. Again, you can see these little buttons across the top starting early 1673, so a little early for me, but I, I would start in about 1830s. That's when my, uh, the 30 to 49 era is when my ancestors moved to uh, Missouri. Of course, we got Arkansas, Secretary of State has an Arkansas history timeline. Um, Wikipedia has some great timelines. Um, you know, of course you take Wikipedia with a grain of salt, but for things like, um, you know, general knowledge, um, it's not bad. I, I kind of like Wikipedia for some of those, um, just what is this about <laughs> kind of idea. So um, history of California uh, is on there just as an example. Um, there's the uh, family search wiki. So you can go there and find the history for, I think all the states, um, but here's Arkansas just to give you a quick look. There's great books out there. This is a fun book that I have. It's just a small little book. It's literally a pocket reference. So it's a tiny little book, uh, The Genealogist U.S. History Pocket Reference, Nancy Hendrickson. And it's just got some fun little um, timelines having to do with history. So um, I recommend it. It was not too expensive, and it's just kind of a fun one to look at. Just as an example, um, there's the Mission Era in California, and I just showed you the, the 1700s, but it goes on for a couple of pages, you know, giving you some background. All right, this website, I think I heard that it may have gone away, but it's in the um, Internet Archive. So in the Wayback Machine. So you should still be able to find it even if it's not live as itself. So, um, and I don't recall if I got that Internet Archive hand, uh, link in your handout. Uh, if not, I'll try to get it at the end or you can email me if you can't find it yourself, I'll try to help. But it's a fantastic website. So I'm sad to hear that this site went away. GenDisasters.com. So if you just go to Wayback Machine and type this in, you should be able to find it. Um, but anyway, it was just um, kind of user driven uh, data about various websites or sorry, various disasters uh, on those on this website. So there's a browse by state. And just to show you by Missouri, um, you could see just a list of things that happened. Um, Aladdin, Missouri, train wreck, Ashburn, Ashburn, Missouri, uh, powder explosion, airline crashes, auto wreck, prison, prison explosion, etc. <laughs> right. And so um, this is a transcription of one I found that is my ancestors lived near Me Mexico, Missouri in this time frame. So they would have um, most likely witnessed this storm. So it's terrific tornado. Many lives destroyed in a Missouri storm. Houses demolished and the inmates killed. I believe they mean the inmates of the houses. I don't think they mean prison, but um, that's the wording. <laughs> a terrific tornado passed three miles northeast of Mexico, Missouri at three o'clock on a recent afternoon in the vicinity of Bean Creek. Fifteen houses in the vicinity of that place were destroyed. Some 10 or 12 persons killed and equal number fatally injured and a large number badly hurt. And then there's um, some paragraphs with the names uh, written in all caps so you can see them easy. So a farmer named Duffy, Don Dorger, Don, James Dorger, Lizzie, Lizzie Dorger, etc. Um, we have Strandberg, Gail Strander, etc. We don't see Mitchell, so he's not listed here, thank, thankfully, um, his family. But, you know, it's three miles outside of um, Mexico, Missouri. And so he would have been there, right, at least, you know, nearby when this happened. So gives you some context um, 
about what's going on. So if my family were the Dorgers or the Ostranders, you know, this might explain why perhaps they moved or um, something happened that they just, they couldn't rebuild and they moved to somewhere else, for example. Okay, so let's look at an, uh, a specific example about building a timeline. Um, we're gonna look at my, uh, another ancestor of mine, a favorite, uh, Samuel Cook Dimmick. So here's a beginning blank spreadsheet that I've made. Uh, I just keep a blank one on my computer and then just start, you know, um, start a new one uh, and save, right, the uh, uh, file as a separate file so I don't overwrite my blank one. <laughs> so I, uh, I've got a blank one uh, that I keep using. So here are those columns that I had mentioned. I have the year, I have the age of the event, the, then the event name, the location, the source, that's where I will put, you know, death certificates or, you know, whatever. And then there's a section for comments. I always have a comment section and a lot of things I do because as you're filling these out, it's going to trigger something that you'll want to look up. And in order to not go chasing the bright, shiny objects, in order to finish this, the timeline before you go do that, I put them in a comments box and then I do that at a separate time. So I don't get lost. <laughs> I can try to finish projects. Um, I just want to say, don't get hung up on the fact that I'm using a spreadsheet here. Um, if you don't like spreadsheets, uh, that's okay. They work similarly as tables in a word processor. So if you're using Word and you insert a table, um, it's very similar in terms of um, that, but some people just prefer it. It's fine. Um, but you can, uh, you know, do most of these same things in a word processor. Um, the thing I like about spreadsheets and tables is the ability to sort. So you can, um, you know, just sit down and do data entry and not worry about what order you're even putting things in and then click on that. Um, usually there's a, a little topper here. I didn't catch it for the screenshot, but um, that you can click and say sort by this column, you know, and it will put them all in order. Right. And so I love that feature. Um, but you can put them in in order if you like doesn't really matter. You can just use a word processor, not necessarily a spreadsheet or a table. Just have to be a little more manual about it, but that's okay. Um, do whatever is going to work for you. Just do it. <laughs> that's the main, the main message. You might decide you want some different column toppers, right? You might decide you want them in a different order, you know, whatever. That's okay. This is what we're working with today. So we're going to look at Samuel Cook Dimmick. So gather the documents you have. Um, you know, this is a tombstone photo I took back in 2001. It was not <laughs> very high quality at that time. You can see it's very pixelated. I'm sure there's a better picture now on Find a Grave, but this is one I took um, of his tombstone. And so from this, we can start adding information to the spreadsheet, right? Um, 1835, he was born. He was not, he was zero at <laughs> his birth. Um, and the location of his birth, of course, I didn't get that from the tombstone. I got it from other information, but you just start adding this data here. So I have tombstone photo, but I should also put what, where do, how do I know he was born in Lyme? I just didn't do it for, for this uh, example. But you see what I'm saying? You just start adding the data, right? Well, what else can we get from that tombstone? Well, death, right? We know he died in 1901. He would have been about 65 at his death. Uh, his death occurred in Ohio Wood County in Bowling Green, and I got the tombstone photo as the source there. Um, here we have his marriage record to Mary F. Marshall. Um, they were married in 1860 in New Hampshire, so we'll add that. And you can see I'm adding age, it's just an approximation at this point. Um, marriage, I have the location, the source is the marriage record, uh, the bride's parents lived in Haverhill. They were married at her house, her parents' house, which is a different town than uh, Lyme, where they lived. So uh, I thought that was a little bit interesting. I might want to look something up about them. So I wrote it in the notes section. Uh, here's the 1870 census. So we have uh, Samuel and Mary, and we have two children, Marshall and Burton. So we can add um, additional information. So for a census, I typically call it a residence. So 1870 residence. This is the location. This is the census. Um, but also we have the two children, like I said, and we have ages for them. So we can put it in the birth of the sons, you know, about 1867 and 69, and he would have been 32 and 34 when those kids were born, right? So it's approximations, of course, and, you know, because I'm not going down to the day, you can do that, especially if you get a lot more detailed and a lot more records, you can get more specific. I tend to just go by year uh, until I need to get more specific. 
Um, so we have those things added. Uh, I typically, just as a, this is a matter of preference on my part, I don't typically include like the birth of his wife on the timeline because it would have, it didn't have a bearing on his life until they got married. Does that make sense? Now, that's not to, um, you know, push aside women or, you know, their issues. But when I'm working on his timeline, I'm putting the events that affected him. So they didn't, she, he wasn't around her when she was born. That's typically my reasoning there. Um, but if for some reason uh, you want to add it, or if I run into a situation where I want to add it, you can, you know, there's no rules, <laughs> there's no rules to any of this stuff. So that's just a preference uh, for my, on my part, because people always ask. So I just wanted to, to say that up front. Um, you know, so the, her birth wouldn't necessarily affect him, but his, the birth of his sons, of course, he would have been there, or at least nearby, right, when they were born. And so um, I put that on his timeline. Now, I could just keep going and going, but you get the idea <laughs> here. I've added several more items, uh, some deeds, some more census records, but there is a pretty big gap. And um, if you look at locations, I think it's an even bigger gap. So between here, I actually have a little highlighter. So between 1870 and 76, they moved from Lyme, New Hampshire to Bowling Green, Ohio. Um, so timelines point that out. I mean, that's about five, five to six years, right? Gap. And that's a pretty big gap. We don't have any census records in between there. Ohio didn't have state censuses. Um, you know, so what other records can I look for to narrow that down? Right. So that's the those are the questions that you need to be asking then when you sit down and analyze your timeline. I spread them out. Let me go back a page. Um, I tend to um, use like adding. There's usually an add a row button that you can just quickly add a row. So I add a row um, to make it more obvious when there's an um, when there's a gap. And so I just add some rows so it's easier to see. But what, what records uh, can help me determine when and maybe why they moved, right? So you know you don't always get a why in genealogy. Uh, we can't really know people's motivations. We can make guesses, right? Um, but unless they left a diary or a letter that just specifically said why they did something, we're typically not going to get the why. But I like to at least try to figure it out. Um, so some things that I thought of, tax records, city directories, county histories um, are all very prevalent in this area in this time frame. Um, I wasn't I wasn't successful in tax records in Bowling Green. They don't have that many available. Um, I didn't find any city directories for Bowling Green at this time frame at the local library or online at the time um, for these years specifically. But I was successful with some with the county history. So this county history of Wood County gives a lot of great detail to be included in his timeline. OK, lots of great detail. I'm only going to focus on a few just to keep things short, um, but there's a ton of information in his biography. And I, I know you can see behind here, it starts here, Samuel Dimmick. It's almost two full columns and it keeps going. It stops kind of behind <laughs> behind here. Um, but I'm going to read a little section to you. Uh, this part, I had to reread that county history a couple of times before it hit me in the face. <laughs> he located at Toledo, Ohio where he was engaged in the manufacture of cans for four years. When he disposed of that business in 1875, we find him a resident of Center Township, Wood County, where he purchased 120 acres of the old Williams farm. You have to go back and reread things. I have looked at this county history a thousand times, and sometimes you're not ready for the information, right? <laughs> sometimes it, it just takes rereading for it to pop out at you. So, aha, he located at Toledo, Ohio first before he went to Wood County. So just to give you some context, um, the uh, uh, Toledo is where the first red arrow is up in Lucas County and Wood County. Bowling Green is kind of right where the O's are, right? It's like kind of right in the middle there. So um, it's not very far away, but it's two separate counties and uh, more records, right? <laughs> About maybe 15 miles as you know they're pretty close together i was born in bowling green i've been to toledo many times i remember i75 it's, it's just kind of a kind of a long but not that far journey all right so let's look at this timeline again we have this gap here there's approximately 5 years or so can i narrow it down i mean i have the county history saying he went to toledo first so let's Let's start looking at some other sources. First of all, I found it um, in my searching for county histories. I found this um, 
it's kind of a county history. <laughs> it's called the New Hampshire Register um, for uh, and Farmer's Almanac, and it's for 1871. And in it, it's got a list of people. It says justices. It says the state, um, you know, level and so on. But it's like a kind of like a uh, I assume like a town councilman almost that in this capacity uh, or maybe some kind of a representative. But here we have Samuel C. Dimmick uh, listed right there. Um, and so he, this was published in 1871. It's hard to know if he was actually still there in 1871 or if he was on his way out. You know, back when they were doing publishing back in this time frame, it took a little while to get that published. So uh, like when we we're looking at city directories, we usually say, uh, you know, give it a year, like it's a year um, perhaps delay between they caught that information and when it actually got published. So I feel like it's very similar case here. <laughs> so it could be 1870 and it's finally published in 1871. Who knows? All right. So here is that time timeline again. I put it in in 1871 because that's when it's published. But, um, you know, I'm going to use a little judgment there. But Toledo is a bigger city than Bowling Green. And so I went back to looking at city directories and lo and behold, <laughs> I found him in the Toledo city directories. Um, Fold3 has these on their website. Um, and it's exactly for the time frame I needed. I found him first in 1872, which is this top one here, 1872. Um, here's S.C. Dimmick. Um, the bottom one is the last one I found him in in 76. So here he is, Dimmick Samuel C. And this is actually his brother, Charles. Um, and uh, again, you kind of need to give it a little bit of uh, leeway in terms of the years because of publishing. But I found him in all the all the city directories in between those. OK. And also he's working at H.M. Clark and Company manufacturers of tin and Japan to wear. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So here we have the timeline again, and I've added all these uh, city directories in, and I, you can see how I quickly narrowed that down, right? I really narrowed it in, <laughs> got a exact timeline on when he left New Hampshire, at least within a year, and when he arrived in Ohio, and then not only in Ohio, but Toledo to Bully Green. So, um, you know, you eventually, you just keep, keep putting these building blocks in, you get a pretty full picture of their life. Um, and it can be really helpful for, you know, writing up biographical sketches, breaking down brick walls, et cetera. Uh, you might notice also that um, there's a little bit of a uh, weirdness. Maybe he's, it's in 1876, he's 40, and in 1876, he's 41. Well, I got some of this information um, from my uh, software, and I have his exact birth date in there. So his birth date had passed when I had put one of those in. So don't worry about those things too much. It's not going to um, it's not going to affect your analysis that much. So it's when there's larger age gaps or, you know, if they re they're they're naming their age on a document and it's way off from what you've already decided, you know, or discovered from other records, then you might want to start paying attention. Right. So that's why I like that age at the time of the event um, category. OK. Let's look at timeline creation, how to go about it. So I already talked about spreadsheets a little bit, but I just want to show you um, with the with the little headers up here in the side. That, so I use a Mac and I use a program called Numbers, but it is almost exactly like using Excel on a Word. Uh, um, uh, not on a Word, on a PC, sorry. <laughs> uh, so it's very similar. So there's generally ways you can sort. There's buttons right up at the top. There'll be a button to sort by, and you can tell it which column you want to sort by. Um, but I really love them for the ability to move things and to sort things quite easily. So like I said before, you can just sit down and focus on putting in the data. You can see that this is not in order, right? I just sat down and typed. I just flipped pages, right, or flipped through what's in my file on my computer and just typed what that information is. Um, then there's ways to sort it. This is just an example out of uh, numbers for, for Mac, but it's very similar. And there's, like I said, buttons at the top. Um, but you can see, you know, I want to sort this, the column named event by ascending. Well, that's going to put it in alphabetical order. But maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to see all the births or maybe you want to see all the residences or maybe you want to sort this column by place. Maybe they went back to Lyme, right? <laughs> and you want to see all the Lyme, New Hampshire stuff together. Who knows, right? Everybody's timeline is going to be different. Typically, I'm using this to say date, 
and sort ascending, and that will put this in date order. That's typically what I do. Um, so here it is in order now, sorted. <laughs> you can also just type it on a word processor. There is no shame in that, <laughs> none whatsoever. So I do this quite a bit um, for my binders. Okay, you guys, I still have paper binders. I, um, I just like to sit down and be able to flip through a binder and look at somebody's life in order. So I have uh, all of my stuff on my computer, but I also have it in a binder so I can kind of, it's kind of like reading a book, right? Reading a book about your, your ancestors. So I do these timelines um, in the front so I can kind of see at a glance what documents I have. It's it's like a visual timeline of their life based on their documents. So this is just an example of a different way to do it, right? So you can see up top, I have like birth and death bold up at the top so I can see, you know, what who I'm looking at, what the range is basically. And then the, the um, dates to the left are the actual documents I have. And then the things indented are um, um, derived from those documents that's the word so like in the census right uh, i have a birth you know he's three years old in this census for example so i have um his birth is 67 so and just etc right i just keep kind of going down what can you extract right what can you derive from that document um that will give you more information for your timeline so this is one way to do it not the only way to do it <laughs> obviously there's you know for every genealogist there's going to be a different way to do something and some and for good reason right it just works better for you all right i had mentioned before your genealogical software can sometimes um make timelines for you and there's all kinds i've played around with various different software packages some of these screenshots might be a little old because i don't keep up with them all all the time i kind of come and go <laughs> so but my point is to look at your software look at the charts it'll generate and the reports that it'll generate and see what it has in terms of timeline in uh, reunion they call it ages at least last time i looked it was called ages <laughs> Not timeline, um, but it's where I can get quickly that age at the time of the event. So you can see here at 24 years, he was married at 32 years. Marshall was born at 34 years. Burton was born and so on. So it's a quick way to um, make a timeline and, um, you know, at a glance, see what happened on various dates or years. Uh, this one is one from Roots Magic a couple of versions ago. But this one's kind of a cool um, timeline in that you can see who was contemporaneous with each other, right? Who were alive at the same time somebody else was alive. This is helpful if you're finding somebody as an informant, right, on a document. You want to know, well, did they even know them? Were they around at the same time? Um, that kind of thing. So this is kind of a fun, fun chart um, that you can use to answer some of those questions. Uh, this is reunion again, um, similar, um, similar chart, right? They're just stacked up in a, in a vertical order. But this is, um, you know, Thomas Carroll Mitchell, and then coming forward with his descendants. So you can kind of see who was alive when Thomas was alive. If you just kind of follow the line down here. <laughs> All right, uh, this is another example from Roots Magic called Timeline. So this is just about one person, Thomas Carroll Mitchell. It gives you the age out to the left and then the date and then the event um, here. Of course, this is old, a little bit older. It might look differently these days just to give you an, uh, an idea of what you're looking for. This is an older family tree maker um, example. Same thing, you know, you can make a timeline report from these software packages. Now, if you're using Ancestry, um, tree uh, online trees they build that timeline for you right so as you're entering facts it's just building this timeline out to the left here so this is my page of thomas carroll mitchell and um, you can see the timeline and the ages and so on happening out here so that's handy all done for you <laughs> there are some packages i do not use any of these so i'm just telling you about them to let you know they exist I don't know how good they are, um, but they look pretty good. Um, but this is Progeny Genealogy. They have a timeline software that will take your GEDCOM and make a timeline for you. There's another one, Timeline Maker, timeline software for business. So even though it's for business, you can adapt these timelines to um, uh, work for genealogy, right? So here, here's just a quick example of one they've used, the 10 bloodiest battles of the Civil War. And you can see from the background, there's various color options and styles and so on. 
There are programs like Smart Draw or LucidChart, or um, I'm sure there's several I'm not thinking of right off the top of my head. But these are drawing um, programs on the web. Uh, actually, Smart Draw, last I knew, they also had a desktop version. But um, you can just make timelines and you know insert images or dates or whatever you'd like to do. I like this one because it made it easy to insert pictures. So I could even I can just upload the the document that I'm building this timeline from. And they of course have different templates, right? And a lot of these sites are very similar. So I'm not trying to sell you on one in particular. I do use LucidChart nearly every day for my job and I use it in my personal research. I really love LucidChart, but again, everybody's different <laughs> um, they have some timelines built in that you can then adapt so even though it looks like a school assignment here you can delete these things they're just kind of built in which i did a little bit of playing around and just just made one up just for fun just a quick example of course i only entered one item but you can see you can get fun with the colors and the shapes of the um the boxes and, and whatever you can make it work for you and however you'd like it to be these are fun i think like as you get more um creative this is um draw.io that's another one draw.io uh, works with your google login anyway you can just have fun and make things more visually appealing to your family <laughs> because i have found that my family gets more into things when there's charts and graphs and, and pictures and so on. And so this is just one example. You can add photographs. You can do all kinds of stuff with these boxes. I just did a really quick um, layout. Now, this is for Mac only, BDocs timeline. So if you have a Mac, this is a cool product. Um, I don't know if there's something similar for PC. I'm sure there is. I just don't know what it is because I'm a Mac user. Um, but so go look and find something because if you're into this, because this is really cool. Um, this takes uh, a timeline that you've created and kind of turns it into a three dimensional movie almost. So let's take a look here. This is just what it looks like flat. And then here is the movie uh, version. OK, go. There we go. <laughs> So you can see that the, the, the timeline items kind of pop out and I have put in documents when I have them available. So I think this just makes it a lot more fun. So this is just um, showing you what, what it does, but you could do like a iMovie sort of voiceovers and just uh, do little, dip, little uh, narrations about each document. Um, you can get really creative and this can make your family a lot more excited about genealogy, right? Some of these interactive um, things do the trick. <laughs> All right, there's some websites out there that are similar um, to pa software packages for building timelines. And I've noticed sadly that some of these just come and go. Like I find one one day and the next day it's gone. So I just want you to go look on like Google or on Cindy's list for timeline um, creation software or not software websites like timeline websites. This one was called Time Glider. I think it's still around. I, I went looking not too long ago. I love this one because it's got the genealogist as it's one of its target audience uh, users, right? <laughs> so I was like, oh, good job. Uh, including us here. Um, but here's what it looks like. You get these little dots, uh, you know, with different symbols. And when you click on them, it brings up a little information. You can have photographs. Like, they're fun. They're really fun. Um, and so my point is to go out online and see if there's some software or not. A, I keep saying software. See if there's a website <laughs> like this uh, that will work for you. And again, uh, I love Cindy's list. Cindy's a good friend of mine, um, and she has a uh, timeline category on her um, on her website. So I encourage you to go check it out. Um, publication software and supplies, templates and forms, et cetera. Uh, interactive online timelines. So those are some places you can go and see what's uh, what's out there, what she's found. And then again, kind of going back to that historical event for context, she's got a few on her um, site as well for various um, uh, timelines. The dye history <laughs> from 2600 BC to the 20th century. That sounds fun. I don't, I don't know uh, if you had dye makers in your family or somebody into weaving or whatever, that might be good. Um, but, you know, there's the Oregon Trail and the timeline of the Great Depression and so on. 
Um, I have done some webinars, as have some other folks <laughs> at Legacy Family Tree webinars. Um, and so this is the, the last time I searched for the timelines uh, at Legacy, and it doesn't even have the one I've done since then. So um, there, there are a lot of options in terms of education, and my way is not the only way to do this. Other people are going to have fantastic ideas as well, and so I highly recommend, you know, checking out uh, as much education on timelines as you can because, like I said, everybody's got uh, different ideas and different um, ways to do it, <laughs> right? Different uses. Uh, I have I've shared with you a few ideas, and other people are going to have a thousand other ideas. So also I wanted to, to give a plug for YouTube. YouTube is excellent for genealogy education. There's a lot of channels out there um, that you can follow. Ancestry has a channel, archives.com, um, the BYU Family History Library, et cetera. And then various people, of course, like Lisa Louise Cook and um, Amy Johnson Crow and, and others, they have their own channels. So if you go to YouTube and just type in timelines genealogy, you'll get a list. And every day this list is gonna be different <laughs> just because of the way algorithms work and, new things that get uploaded but um this is uh the last time i did it and of course ancestry at top there creating timelines to better understand records and families um 16 minutes right so they're short they're not very long um so anyhow uh i got 48 4400 results or something when i did this one and of course it's uh not everything necessarily genealogy related famous Egyptian pharaohs at the bottom here <laughs> may not be quite as useful. Um, illustrated Bible, you know, that's a little bit out of our genealogical time frame, as it were. So anyhow, YouTube, legacy, etc. Um, so I do have, we have a lot of time for questions. Um, I did want to give a quick plug for the squad. Uh, Patty mentioned it at the beginning. The Genealogy Squad is um, the Facebook group, very popular. We have, I think we're almost up to 55,000 members now. But um, we have, uh, it's run by Drew Smith and George Morgan, the genealogy guys, Cindy Engel of Cindy's List and myself. And uh, we really try to keep it a fun, positive, useful place. Um, and we really do kick the riffraff out quite quickly. Any sort of trolls and arguments and whatnot, we try to nip all that in the bud. So it's a really friendly um, and useful. That's the best thing we want it to be is useful, helpful. Um, so if you have any kind of questions, um, come and ask. And you know how when you post things on Facebook, the haters come out, we get rid of them. So don't be afraid. We will handle it. <laughs> so come on over to the genealogy squad and join us. Um, we love to help help people over there. OK, there we Excellent. go. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so <laughs> much, Carrie. That was Thank you. Sick. Um, Wow, that was excellent. Um, okay, so let's open it up for um, any questions or comments that you might have for Carrie. And, um, you know, one of the things when you very first got started, I thought about uh, adding that historical context and with county boundary changes and putting that in your timeline, I thought that is so brilliant. Yeah. Um, one of my... Um, ancestors that came to Texas in 1850, adding, um, adding those boundary changes will be very helpful because he came to Navarro County and then Hill County split off from Navarro County. Yeah. So that Did he split off with it was like he in that part that split. He was. Yes. Ah, yeah. He became the sheriff of Hill County in 1857 <laughs> and he was uh, the treasurer um, of the Hill County's um, so, you know, it, it's that that was really cool. So I added nice. going to add this into the chat of where I, I found some great oh, yeah. information on the random acts of genealogy kindness. And they have actually all the counties in all 50 states and uh, they'll tell what counties, um, you know, uh, split off from which county, w when the county began, if there's extinct counties in a state and, uh, and burn counties. So that has been a very, very helpful site for me. But anybody That's Anybody else have? Well, just before we go on, I would like to add, I, I didn't even add it to my slides, but the Historical County Boundary Atlas at the Newberry Library is also oh. good for very similar um, um, reasons. And they have maps. I don't know. I've only just pulled up what you shared, so I can't tell. But they have some maps that will even show you where the boundaries 
change over time. So oh, that's really, that's really nice cool. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions for Carrie? Any comments? We had one question online that generated a fair little bit of discussion here. Uh, Rosalind Dowling, do you want to unmute and ask any follow-ups you have about uh, recommendations for software? Nope. <laughs> nope, I guess not. So is there well, somebody... I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for the question and just to see. Yeah, she had asked if you uh, used Excel for your spreadsheet, oh. but then you, that was right before you moved into a lot of the recommendations. Yeah. I just wanted to make See, sure she had to That's follow. another good reason to do questions at the end, because often I answer the questions. <laughs> yes. People don't know what's coming. Yeah, I use I tend to use numbers on my Mac, um, but it works very similarly um, at, to Excel. So it's not that different, and you can save it files as Excel files and share and, and so on. So I use um numbers but it's very similar so the slides i showed you should have been general enough <laughs> that you could have um could have seen them could it they could make sense i guess what i'm trying to say all right is there a question from the audience <laughs> i see it can you put too much information on a timeline well that's an excellent question <laughs> i think that probably the answer is probably <laughs> um I like to, it depends on how much you can handle when you're sitting down to analyze something, right? So how, how much can you um, take in, right? Sometimes they get too cluttered for me. I'm also the person that needs a clean house, decluttered counter space, and so on. So I like to keep my timeline simple um, because then I, I don't know, I just have an easier time. But if you're wanting to perhaps write a biographical sketch about an ancestor, really want to get their their life um, really detailed, then go crazy, you know, because that's going to basically be the outline for what you're writing. So it just depends, right? <laughs> that's the big genealogy answer is it depends on what your purpose is. And I can see yes and no for that. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. All right, good. Next, we have a question from Barbara Schneider. Uh, I wonder if, if you have any comments about putting a single person or a couple in a timeline. Yeah, depends and that's the question. Perhaps. Yeah, it's very similar to what I just said. It depends on what your goal is for doing that analysis. If it's if it makes sense to see two people together, either in order or side by side, like I shared, then yes, definitely do that. Um, it, I just personally don't uh, put this, the 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 second person of that couple, the spouse in until they're um, married, just because I want to keep it about that single person. But I can see reasons why I would do it otherwise as well. So it just, like I said, kind of depends. It depends on how much information you want in one timeline. I'm usually trying to solve a problem. So my timelines don't get too huge. I'm just like, okay, when did they move from Lyme to Bullet Green, right? And so uh, my timelines tend to be very focused, but yeah just depends, like I said. We have another one online, Jim, if you don't have any there. Uh, Lisa H., would you like to unmute and ask your question? She has no mic, so let me, ah. on, on her behalf, when creating a timeline, are there any pros or cons in creating a new file for each timeline versus creating on a workbook in Excel, mm -hmm. for example, or multiple sheets for each person's timeline? Um, again, I think it depends on a couple of things. One being your filing system. So if you have a, a way you keep your files on your computer, you might want to do separate files for each person. Like I like to see Thomas Carroll Mitchell's timeline and Thomas Carroll Mitchell's file. So if I did a bunch of people that were, even if they're in a different generation in the Mitchell family, I might get, I might get confused about where that is. <laughs> so I like to keep them separate, but if that works for you, definitely go and do that. I would, a couple of things I would say is I would keep them like by family group or by surname or something, um, you know, so that your workbook files so that the file itself makes sense and you keep it somewhere where you can easily find it. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I can see, you know, guys, every time you guys ask these questions, I'm like, I can see both reasons why to do it one way and why to do it another way. Um, just depends on what your um, 
yeah, what your filing system is like. I think it's about filing more than anything um, in terms of where do you keep that file. So when I, in my computer, I have Thomas Carroll Mitchell, you know, in a file and I have like all the things I've created for him. I have all his documents in there. And mm -hmm. so um, that's how I do it. So it makes sense to me to keep them separate. <laughs> How's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> I will plug the squad again because every Friday, Cindy Ingle does a it's filing Friday post. And so she talks about things all the time having to do with filing, either digitally, paper, you know, how to name your files. Like she's got something every week on that very topic. So highly <laughs> recommend joining the squad just for the, the filing Friday <laughs> post. Thanks, Carrie. We don't have any others online at the moment. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I don't think there's any more here either. Um, Carrie, thank you very much. It was a very great presentation. I know personally, I use timelines all the time. I mean, a lot of times <laughs> timelines will be that aha moment where you're going, wow, I've never knew that before. So it can really help you discover some neat things. I That's want to thank right. everybody for your attendance. <laughs> And I hope to see you back next week. And I hope you all have a good afternoon. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. All right. Yeah. The genealogy sure. squad group in the um, in our chat. Somebody asked about how to fight. I put it in for you. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Okay. I got yeah. it twice. It's all good. Yeah. Ah, good. Good deal. The genealogy squad. Patty, was there a hand? Was there a handout for Carrie's presentation? Yes, it's in the chat. Okay. I'll add it in there one more time. If okay. for anybody who came late into it, um, we didn't get those for the people that are here live. So we will put that on our on our website. Yes, um, it's on the website. And, and make that available for you. Oh, it is okay. So that is on our website. So when y'all go home, be sure and download that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Carrie. Thank you. This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your fees have been supporting these and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, please consider joining now. Go to dallasgenealogy.org and click on the Membership tab.